let me just step back for one minute. Your financial success was extraordinary in Russia. You went from almost nothing to making a billion dollars, losing it all in the crisis. Take us from that point. What happened? You lost it all. Then how did you make it back? So I, I lost all. So I, I owned oil companies and I lost 90% of my money. And when I say my money, I mean my investors' money. Investors' money. So I'm sitting there and I'm feeling very bad about that because here I, I am. I'm a, uh, I, I've convinced all these people to invest with me. I lose 90% of their money. It's a terrible feeling. And I, and I say to myself, I've got to get these people out of this hole. And so even though everybody else I knew had left Russia after 1998, I decided to stay and to, to, to try to fight my way out of this hole. So, so you lost all your money, and then you found a couple of great insights by which you made it back. Explain that to us. Which of the stocks you had picked? Well, the most famous situation I was involved in was <clears throat> Gazprom. Gazprom is the largest oil yes. and gas company in the world. Gazprom was trading at a 99.7% discount <clears throat> to Exxon and BP per barrel of hydrocarbon reserves. Why was it so cheap? The reason it was so cheap was because everybody thought that every last penny from the company had been stolen. stolen. So one of my big questions that I asked myself and I asked my research team is, how do we analyze what's really been stolen? Because I can't believe that 99.7% of the company has been stolen. And so we all kind of shrugged. We, we, we knew we couldn't go to the company and ask them the question because they would throw us out or far worse. And, and we couldn't go to the investment banks who were knowledgeable about this because they were so busy trying to get corporate finance work that they weren't going to tell us. And so we decided to do something called a stealing analysis. So uh, how do you do a stealing analysis? This wasn't a class they taught me at Stanford Business School. What we decided to do is we made appointments for breakfast, lunch, tea, coffee, dinner, dessert, with anyone we thought had knowledge of how the stealing was taking place, and asked them outright, could you tell us about the stealing? And I had no idea whether anyone would cooperate with us, but I discovered the most interesting thing about the Russian um, psychology, which is that during the, most, during the communist time, the richest person in Russia maybe had six times greater wealth than the poorest person. By 1999, when we do an analysis of Gazprom, it was like 250,000 times richer than the poorest person. Resentment. Anger like you can't believe. And so every time we sat down with one of these people, they would start just telling us the whole story about all sorts of crazy stuff. We were writing it down in our notebooks. But then the question was, how do we know if any of this is true? I mean, it could be just sour grapes or exaggeration. People, you know, we have no way of proving it. Then I discovered the second most interesting cultural anomaly about Russia, which is that the country is the most bureaucratic country in the world. Under central planning, the government had to collect information on everything. How many eggs were eaten, produced, electricity, everything. And there were records. There were records everywhere. You just needed to know, know where to go. And so I got one of my analysts figured out where to go to get these records. And we got the records. We compared it with all these allegations. And we proved something very interesting. Now, two things very interesting. The first thing was that the amount of gas and oil reserves stolen out of Gazprom between 1996 and 1999 by nine individuals was equal in size to the oil and gas reserves of Kuwait. <laughs> People go to war for that. People went to war for that. Countries went to war. The United States went to war yes. to, to save Kuwait from Iraq <laughs> over Kuwait's mm -hmm. oil fields. Yeah. Was, so, now, that's the first discovery. The second discovery, and this is what makes it such an interesting investment story, is that oil and gas reserves of Kuwait only represented 9.65% of Gazprom's total reserves. In other words, more than 90% of the gas reserves and oil reserves were still on the balance sheet. Wow. So the market is assuming a 99.7% depletion. Discount. We've just found that 90% is still there. Now, what do you do when you, you back up the truck? You back up the truck, and that's what we did. I made it my single largest investment. Now, that's usually where the fund managers stop. But we had this unbelievable information. And so what do we do with it? I took it over to the Financial Times, to the Wall Street Journal, to the Washington Post, to the New York Times, and I gave each of them a chapter from our stealing analysis. And they wrote it up. And one after another after another, stories started coming out. And Suddenly after, you were worth $4.5 billion, though, right? Uh, under assets under management. Well, so, so after, this, after we exposed this thing, they fired the CEO, the share price doubled, it doubled again, doubled, 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 100 times up Gazprom shares. And this is the biggest company in the country. My assets under management grow from 100 million to 4.5 billion. I'm the largest foreign portfolio investor in Russia. 
It's an amazing situation. You created enemies, though. Can you imagine? I mean, so here I am exposing all this corruption, and every time I expose it, somebody doesn't get to do it. And we're talking about billions of dollars. And so... So suddenly you don't become a friend of the Russian government. You become on the uh, enemy of the state, in a manner of speaking. By exposing corruption, I became an enemy of Vladimir Putin. And on November 13, 2005, as I was flying back to Russia, after um, living there for 10 years, being the largest foreign investor in their country, I was stopped at Sheremetyevo 2 airport. I was um, held in the detention center of the airport for 15 hours, and then I was deported and declared a threat to national security. So, so you get a red alert, in a manner of speaking, and you get all your money out of Russia, right? None of your money is stuck in Russia. Correct. So I, I'm, when, when Russia turns on you, they don't do so mildly. They do so with extreme prejudice. And so I knew that getting kicked out was just the beginning of my troubles. And so what did I have that they could take? I had people and I had assets. So I evacuated my staff and I sold every last share I had in Russia. Got all the money out so my client's money was not exposed. I thought, no people, no assets. End of story. But the tale gets murkier. What happens then? They actually steal your companies? So about a year and a half after I was kicked out, on June 4th, 2007, 25 Moscow police officers raid my office, 25 more police officers raid the office of my law firm, my American law firm, and they seize all of our stamps, seals, and certificates from our investment holding companies, the companies through which we had invested all this money. They seize all these things, and the next thing we know, we no longer own our investment holding companies. Now, these companies were empty. There were no assets in them. So why would they steal them? Why would someone steal empty shell companies? Well, they didn't know that there was no assets in them. So they steal these companies. And the next thing we discover, they're going to our banks in Moscow looking for assets. But there are no assets there. So in the midst of all this, we hire the smartest lawyer I know, a young man named Sergei Magnitsky. Who is the hero of your book also. Who is the hero of my book. I call him the bravest man I've ever known. Sergei Magnitsky researches how this whole thing was going down. And he discovers something truly shocking. That in addition to trying to steal our assets, which they didn't succeed in doing, this group of corrupt police officers and other government officials ended up going to the tax authorities. And our companies in the previous year, when I was, at, when I was liquidating everything, paid $230 million of taxes. And they orchestrated a $230 million fraudulent tax refund that they applied for on the 23rd of December, 2007. And it was approved one day later. The largest tax refund in Russian history approved in one day on Christmas Eve. You were also tried in uh, absentia. And Sergei, after he was dead, was tried in court. The first time that has happened. So the Russians um, ultimately arrested Sergei. My other lawyers g fled the country and got to England safe. Sergei didn't. He refused to leave. He was an idealist. Um, he testifies against the police officers. They arrest him. They torture him for 358 days, and they kill him five and a half years ago. And that changed your life from being a, an investor looking for bargains to being a human rights activist? So Sergei worked for me. He was my lawyer. If he hadn't worked for me, he'd still be alive today. He was tortured to death in a Russian prison for exposing corruption as my lawyer. And I take this, I took it terribly. I take it terribly. It's very personal, very upsetting. He'd still be alive today. And I made a vow on the day that I learned of his death, which was the day after they killed him. I made a vow to his memory, to his family, and to myself. I wasn't going to let these people get away with it. And I've been on a fight for justice ever since. You've actually passed a law in Europe and in America called the Magnitsky Law. Could you explain that to us in a minute? Well, so what, what happened was, after Sergei was killed, um, I thought for sure that we'd be able to get some justice. Sergei did something very unusual while he was in prison, which is he wrote everything down. He wrote 450 complaints in his 358 days in detention, documenting every last detail of what happened to him. We all, there's no, this is not a matter of speculation. We, we have a testimony from the grave. And this stuff was so detailed and so granular and so documented, I thought for sure they had to give us, give us justice in Russia. But they didn't. Instead, what they did was they covered up the whole crime. They exonerated everybody involved. They gave special state honors to the most complicit people. Um, and so I said, I said, I said to myself, if we can't get justice inside of Russia, let's seek justice outside of Russia. And the, the, the thing that's most, most upsetting about this crime is it was done for money. They did it for this theft of $230 million. They killed Sergei for that money. 
And these people don't like to keep that money in, in the country. They like to take it, put it in banks and in the U.S. and Europe, etc. And so we said to ourselves, if we can um, ban their visas and freeze their assets, it's not justice in the true sense of the word, but it's better than total impunity. And so I went to the U.S. Congress and I said to them, do you want Russian torturers and murderers coming to America? Here's the Sergei Magnitsky story. And I sat down and told the story to John McCain and Senator Benjamin Cardin and McGovern. many other, McGovern and all sorts of other people. And they said, no, of course we don't want these people coming to America. And they said, let's make a law. And they called it the Magnitsky Law. And it took a while. There was a lot of politics involved. But eventually, in December 2012, um, we had the Senate vote on it 92 to 4. The House of Representatives voted 89%. And President Obama signed it into law on December 14th, 2012, named after Sergei Magnitsky, my lawyer, which imposes visa sanctions and asset freezes on the people who killed him and the people who do similar types of crimes in Russia. Bill, it's been fascinating talking to you about Russia, the ruble, and so many things in our modern world. We love your book, Red Notice, How I Became Putin's Number One Enemy. It's a great read. All of you are interested in emerging markets, I strongly recommend it. Thank you so much for being a guest on RD360 today. Thank you.